Welcome to episode 211 of the Disorganized Wizards Club podcast. My name is Alex. I'm joined by my co-host, Cam. Hello. How's it going, Cam? Oh, pretty good. good. Thanks for having me join you. This this intro is definitely more awkward, and it keeps throwing me off when I don't immediately go to Adam. <laughs> well, there's someone else Hello. you can immediately go to. I, I almost did, and I was like, wait, he's not here. I had him. <laughs> I would have answered. <laughs> But we have a special uh, a special guest this week, returning special guest, the Canadian icon himself, Mr. Phil Sams. How you doing? I'm doing quite well, actually. How about yourselves? Pretty good. Pretty good. Glad to have you back on the show. It's been a while. I think last time we had Phil on the show was when we were still recording the, the episodes in my bedroom, all in per- person. So that was a couple of years ago. So it's it's been a while. I don't... What... what, what what were we talking about last time Phil was on the show? Do you remember, Cam? Was I there? I think uh, so. And by that question, I mean I don't remember. <laughs> I actually don't think you were. I think it was me, Adam, and Stelly. You might have been there. Maybe. I don't know. That That's how long ago it was. It's been a while. So yeah. I, I would shout out the episode he was on, but that would require us to have done some research before this. And uh, <laughs> uh, there's no way we're organized enough to do that. And I just thought about it on the spot. So welcome back also, to the show. Also, 2020 has been like a decade. So <laughs> you're, you're allowed to not remember these things. Yeah, it might as well have been 10 years ago. Who knows? But I was going to say it was back when I still lived in Ottawa, but it wasn't that long ago. Oh, that's true, huh? <laughs> I think it was like one of the first times I had been back visiting, but I had already moved since then. Yeah, that that sounds about right. Regardless, we're happy to have you back on the show, filling in for Adam this week. We've got a jam-packed show, lots to talk about. Kick things off. As always, shout out to our sponsor, WizardTower.com, your source for all your magic single needs. Christmas is, what, a week away now? You got some last-minute gifts you want to buy for a special nerd in your family? WizardTower.com is the place to go. Oh, it is only a week away. Yeah. It oh, is quite bad. literally a week away. It's terrifying. Huh. Yeah, we're, we're already here. It's weird. The past, like, since I quit my job back in October, the past couple of months have just all been a blur. And it's wild how fast they've gone by. And I've, I haven't been doing anything. <laughs> oh, I know how it feels, yeah. <laughs> yeah, time is a social construct anyways. Yeah. It's just weird because time went by so slow at the beginning of March. Like March and April felt like 10 years. And now, like COVID's still happening, except I'm just not working. I'm just hanging out at home. And time is flying by now. I, d- I just don't understand how that works like, oh, that way. It's super easy to lose an evening. Like I open up Arena, put on some coffee slash tea house ASMR background ambience vibes, and then it's the next day. Yeah. That sounds incredible. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the exact background music I want to my life. Yeah, it's this eight hour long YouTube video I found. Nice. Well, you're, speaking, you're going to have to send me that. Speaking <laughs> of YouTube videos, if you want to check out some content from the DWC, youtube.com slash the disorganized wizards club is the place to go. Got a cool uh, video we posted last week as a companion piece to the podcast. If you want to check out that mana base case study via video form, you can head over there to check that out. And uh, we're still working on building that channel. So if anyone wants to check out some cool stuff, we'd appreciate you do that. Just throw us a sub, like a video. It's all great. And I think that that's all the shilling I have to do for now so we can start talking about some stuff. Actually, I we, think you forgot to shill for something. Did I forget to shill for something? Did not Did you not forget to shill for dwc.gg? Oh my God, I did. dwc.gg, <laughs> your home for all DWC content. You've got the podcast, you've got articles, you've got Patreon, Twitch, YouTube, MTG Melee events, all there, one place, dwc.gg. Bookmark that website if you haven't already. It's the place to go for everything the Disorganized Wizards Club. Professional content creators, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean uh, we're just staying on brand. That's all it is. The extremely disorganized Wizard Club. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the most successful entrepreneurs know how to outsource and delegate tasks. And when we have a guest on, we have faith that they will make up for our shortcomings. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> We're just trying to keep you involved in the show. That's yeah. really all it is. I'm helping. <laughs> 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 All right, so what happened over the last weekend in Magic? I guess the biggest thing for most people uh, was the Arena Open. It was historic this time. For day one, you had the option of playing best of one or best of three. Uh, different numbers of wins, different gem counts and stuff for each type of attempt. But if you, I think, went undefeated in best of... Well, if you went 4-0 in best of three or 7-2 in best of one, you qualified for day two. Day two, you had to play to win potentially $2,000. So we have... I mean, that was the last weekend. We have some results about decks that did well, but... I guess we can start off by saying if any of us played it. So, Steli, you did a run. I did a run. Phil, uh, you did not. Yeah, I basically don't have historic arena cards, so I sat out. Fair enough, yeah. I, I just haven't been playing as much Magic as I was early on in my unemployment days. Uh, I've been spending most of my free time playing World of Warcraft Shadowlands, so I didn't really test at all. I just played four color mid range, uh, went one one, got like pretty horribly unlucky in the second match, kind of like I have been in every any time I've fired up arena over the past couple weeks. Anyone who's tuned into DWC versus uh, nine p.m. Eastern every Wednesday night, twitch.tv slash disorganized wizard club <laughs> would probably know by now how my luck has been. So. I, af after I got that loss in the second round, I kind of I. It's not like I had anything else to do. I had the whole rest of my day free, and I I just kind of decided that it wasn't it wasn't worth the strain on my mental health. So I closed down Arena, fired up World of Warcraft, and that was that. And then back into the Shadowlands, you went. <laughs> and then back in, <laughs> back in I went. Yeah. So it uh, it Your wasn't was much of an video. attempt from me, but yeah, I I mean. Going in on basically zero testing, I, I'm not really surprised at the result I ended up on. How, how did you I do did. in your run, Cam? All right. Well, I did a little bit of testing. The night prior, I was trying to decide if I wanted to play. And so I took Autumn Burchett's Goblins list through a Historic League and just like 5 out it pretty easily. So I figured, all right, this uh, clearly I just have to do the same thing tomorrow. So... Took goblins for a run through it. Ended up going 2-1. And I don't know, I'm not like happy or disappointed with how things went. They were just about as I expected. My first round matchup was like a Naya Adventures deck. Like it wasn't a real historic deck. And after I won game one with Amoxis, they just conceded during sideboarding. So that was easy. <laughs> uh, round two was a goblins mirror. Which I don't feel is a very skill intensive matchup. Well, what um, makes you think that, Cam? Well... I actually, I think game one, we both Moxist each other, but then my second Moxist killed them. Right game on. two, I like just stumbled and all my guys got killed and then I got Moxist and died. And game three, on turn two, I played Wily Goblin. And on turn three, I played Iron Craig feet Moxist and they died. So awesome. it was fun. And then my third matchup was against Four Color in which I lost a close game three because uh, I needed like, my second Muxus was fine, or my first Muxus was fine, but didn't have a haste creature. And then in my second Muxus, there was a window after they had tapped out where they had like a bunch of Nissa lands and like an Uro. But if I hit enough things off of my second Muxus, then I could still kill them past their blockers. And it hit just a Skirk Prospector. So I didn't get to kill them that turn, and then I got hmm. languished, and then I was dead. Just a Prospector, you say? Yep. That's that's not what we sign up for. <laughs> that is definitely not what you what you want there. But I mean, that game three against or yeah, the game three I played in the goblins mirror, I got like six goblins and Krenko and like multiple lords. So, you know, overall across the day, I had pretty good muxes. They're average, so I can't complain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I didn't really want to sit through that again. So I only did the one run. Fair enough. Fair enough. I've we just been playing a bunch of like drafts instead. That's what I did after I Lived out of the arena open. Zendikar Rising, I like didn't draft it that much for the beginning, but I've been playing a ton recently. I don't know why I like got back into it, but I don't know if people are have switched to like the cube draft or if they're playing Kaladesh or whatever, but it's been pretty soft on that ladder. I played like 10 or so drafts in the last couple days. And I seven or three owed like seven of them. Jeez. Yeah, it's been wild. <laughs> You're ranking up and limited or what? Well, no, I'm playing like the traditional ones where there's no rank. I've just been winning oh. gems. 
Jeez. I like doubled my gem count. Yeah. Wow, crazy. you're rich. Yeah. <laughs> so if you like drafting and you think Zendikar was fun, ladder seems soft right now. That's all I've been doing. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I did, so I did some drafts too. I didn't this. I didn't initially think I would enjoy Zendikar Rising that much. Then I realized I should just be taking Ardent Electromancer over everything, and then uh, got a lot more fun. Electromancer is pretty good. I actually. So I remember when we did our Zendikar Rising overview episode, um, we kind of dunked on Green Red and said it's not that good. And I still agree that the Green Red Landfall strategy is not good. Like if you're trying to play a Coom Hellhound or the other like X ones that get plus one plus one and or whatever until end of turn, it's like probably going to be bad. But I maybe other people have got that conclusion as well because they're just not taking green and red cards. And so I've just been playing the good green creatures with the good red removal and smacking people. There's like Jirago, whatever the three two that draws a card, Wheeling. Like I'm getting late Canopy Bayloth. People aren't taking Royal Eruption. It's been pretty easy. Yeah, you just play green red air quotes party, where party is you want to have two. Yeah, you can play then, some of the good warriors and like the wizards. There's a couple good green red wizards and then like red removal. Don't play the pump spells. Don't play the landfall creatures other than like canopy bailoff, maybe a territorial scythe cat and just smack also, people. Also, if you're playing best of one, do play the pump spells. Ah, oh, see, I only do the best of three, so I'm not sure How about that. That's good advice. Oh, yeah, all of my drafting was best of one and you're like your whole. When you're drafting green, red, and best of one, your whole goal is to just punk people out. And so, yeah. Yeah, that makes you just sense. Wanna be, you just want to be playing like a two drop on turn two and then like turn three going like Electromancer, Electromancer, or Electromancer, another creature, and then next turn, Electromancer, another creature. So it's fun. It's nonsense. Yeah, well, that's, I've been having a good time. That, that's generally how I interact with Limited on Arena. Just try and do goofy stuff and then complain when my deck fails. And I'm like, oh, I'm so unlucky. It's like, <laughs> well, maybe if your deck didn't suck, it's like, nah, well, I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so long since I've done a draft on Arena. I think I have like seven draft tokens saved up, maybe even a sealed token or something. I just haven't used oh, well. them. Just draft some nonsense. And like, yeah. if you lose, you're like, whatever. I didn't expect to win anything anyways. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, then, then if you do win, you're like, I'm a god. Yeah, maybe one <laughs> of these days I'll uh, fire up a draft queue and get back into it. But What you got to do is uh, get a bunch of us together, have a couple drinks, and see where the draft takes you. Mm-hmm. That, that does sound more fun than doing it on my own. We definitely see? used to do that. I mean, like years ago, people would all come over and we'd have like a drafts and draft night. If I ever get back to Ottawa, that's on the schedule for sure. We actually used to stream them too. Do you remember that? Like sitting yeah. in our living room, yeah. Bill, um, you're like trying to click the cards in Moto, and everyone's yelling at you. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, the, st- the stress-free gaming. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Straight casual draft. <laughs> Man, I do remember that. That was so much fun. That Should was bring so that ago. back in some in some shape or form. The best was. Like not understanding why we were losing, and we were all like ten beers deep. It's like I can't believe we lost again. <laughs> we're just making the perfect decisions. <laughs> we're reasonably thinking through all of this, and we don't have competing opinions. It's wild that we're losing. <laughs> someday How did we lose again. Someday in the future, when we all can get together again, we'll uh, we'll have to do that. I mean, we have the power. We have the powers of technology. We can just do it through Discord. Yeah, it's True. not. It's not the same, though. It's it's not the same, but I mean, it's better than the nothing we currently have. That, that's true. Yeah. And I'm always down for any excuse to have a beer or three or six. It's been a long time since I've had a beer. Not gonna lie, a real long time. Well, that sounds like a fixable problem. <laughs> yeah. My girlfriend brought bought me some uh, gluten free beer so I could have beer, and I just I like I appreciate the effort. But I looked at it and I was like, "There's no way I'm putting that in my body." Why? Just, it's just looks like gluten free beer. It's not what. Yeah, but did you try it? Maybe it tastes the same. I doubt it. Well, you can't just guess. Cam, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna drink some beers, it needs to be the real thing. All right. Why? What do you mean? Why? Like. It, beer are not required. It's not like a I'm a beer necessary purist. thing for survival. As long as it tastes like beer, beer so, purist. What's, what's the difference? Beer purist. 
If it ain't wow. if it ain't a beautiful golden corona, I'm not interested. So snobby. <laughs> yeah. I'm snobby. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it's okay to enjoy something that's beer adjacent every once in a while mm. it's yeah, actually been a really long time since i've drank at all i'm just realizing that so all i do is hang out at home right mm-hmm. i don't know i'm not i'm not like a casual drinker i don't just i won't just have a beer with dinner or just when i'm hanging out on my own it's got to have a purpose <laughs> yeah well, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't, I don't really drink outside of like social gatherings, so yeah. I just unintentionally haven't had a drink in months. It's like a cost thing for me. Like, having like a drink with dinner just for like the taste is far too expensive. <laughs> it's far too. I'm just gonna get a juice. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then at what point does the juice become too expensive? You should just go to water. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do water a lot. What ty- at what point does the juice become too expensive? I don't know. You can get those peace teas here at the grocery store for 89 cents. So I'm going to say a dollar is the point at which it becomes too expensive. Uh, Cam, Cam, you're just still you're still living the university lifestyle. Yeah. Well, one, once you're done, you get your big boy job and you have money. You'll, you'll think back and be like, wow. <laughs> then I too can refuse to spend it on gluten-free beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> big boy job, what's that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't know. I'm unemployed, so someone will have to tweet at us and let me know. <laughs> yeah. Make sure to tweet at us what it's like to actually be an adult. Mm-hmm. I'll have to get one of those at, uh, at some point. When I quit my job, I said I would probably start actively looking come January, but I don't know if I want to. If, that's very soon. It's only a few weeks <laughs> away. <laughs> it's really crept up on you, hasn't it? Yeah. It's all, all like that was back in October, and now it's now it's almost Christmas. I'm like, wow, where did the time go? I don't, I don't want to start <laughs> working again yet. I still, yeah, I still it, got it, saved. It sucks. It sucks. Don't recommend. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't been bored though. I've had plenty of stuff to do. So I don't understand all the people who just were complaining about being bored at home during quarantine. I'm like, do you not have hobbies? Do you stuff? not have? Do you not have World of Warcraft? Do you, yeah, do you, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> May I introduce you to our Lord and Savior, World of Warcraft? <laughs> Tell you a tale about a wonderful land called Azeroth, where anything is possible. It is a pretty good place. <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> let's let's talk about some magic. Uh, yeah, historic. If we want to talk about <laughs> some real successful adults. Yeah, these are the decks that got seven wins on day two of the arena open. I yeah. mean, maybe not adults, but they were successful at least. True. Yeah. Pretty. And it's about what we expected from the historic format. There were four Saltai midrange decks, and then one copy each of uh, Goblins, Junsack, Simic Paradox, Teamer Paradox, Blue White Auras, Grixis Arcanist, and then some aggro decks, Mono Black Vampires and Mono Red Aggro. Yeah. There might be more. These are just the ones we have so far uh, until Wazzy releases all of them. But yeah, this is just like based on what. Uh, this is based on what. Arena Zone found on Twitter, I believe. So nothing official. I'm sure we'll get all of the lists posted sometime within the next week. They usually do. We can talk about that mm-hmm. a little bit more. But yeah, pretty wide range of archetypes outside of Saltai, which I mean is just kind of par for the course here. There was another big historic event. The SCG Call Time Qualifier was historic. Uh, the top eight looks pretty much... Like what you would expect. There's a lot of salt eye mid range. Also, shout out Big Goon <laughs> with his ninth place finish. Oh, uh, really? Well, I mean, ninth place isn't actually bad though in these events because they cut to top twelve. Uh, so yeah, he, he actually made strange. some money uh, in this one. So not nice. not a complete miss coming in at ninth place. So uh, big shout out to that guy, friend of the DWC, but. I think really over the past week, the deck that's get, been getting a lot of hype and a lot of attention are the uh, Paradox Engine decks. And we've seen them evolve from what we saw originally from Kai Buddha at the Zendikar Rising Championship. Uh, this deck being focused on you know winning with uh, Jace, uh, four mana War of the Spark Jace. I can't actually... Wilder of Mysteries, that's the one. Mm-hmm. And now they've all pretty much evolved into... I mean, they're all Simic-based, of course, but we've seen a few different versions, some just staying straight Simic, some staying Saltai. We've seen a Teamer version. 
But their main win condition now is through Karn the Great Creator. Um, no longer, you no longer have to mill yourself out and win with Jace. And I mean, to the surprise of absolutely no one, the Car Karn the Great Creator fits perfectly into a four Emery Lurker of the Lock deck featuring uh, Mind Stones, Mox Ambers, and Paradox Engine. Who would have thought? I mean, some people had thought. this. I was surprised by the Jace Wielder of Mysteries Tamiyo version that showed up at the Zendikar Rising Championship. And I thought that that was like the new innovation because the versions of Paradox Engine decks I had seen on the ladder up until then were all Karn the Great Creator decks, you know, using it to go get Aetherflux Reservoir so that uh, once you get your loop going and you just cast a bunch of spells, you gain arbitrary life from the reservoir and just one shot your opponent. That's what I had been seeing. So it was also like pretty unretuned lists. They might have also been playing Forsaken Monument or something. But yeah, like the only ver version of Karn decks I remember seeing before were all the you know Forsaken Monument decks that were mono brown or maybe blue brown. Um, nothing like Simic featuring Emery or Kinnon or anything like that. I uh, not Kinnon, but I had seen like a Paradox Engine Emery Karn blue base deck like on ladder once or twice while I was playing Historic Ladder. Mm -hmm. Regardless, though, there was the brief excursion into yeah, just trying to mill yourself out, drawing your deck with looped artifacts, looped chromatic spires uh, with Embry. But now we're back to just blasting people with uh, Aetherflux Reservoir, and I think. The Karn also just like adds a bunch of resiliency to the deck because obviously you get access to a Karn wishboard, which really shores up your game ones in a lot of matchups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Karn just like does a decent amount of work in some matchups as well. Um, just with its uh, its uh, what's it? Its static ability. Yeah, true. Shuts so, off Witch's Oven. Yeah, shuts off food sometimes. What else does it hit? What's the name of that that deck? I guess it gets Mind Stones that have Goblins that are playing them now sometimes. Oh, not um, Martyr Vehicles. Not that it's an actual big part of the metagame uh, or anything, yeah. but... It to, might get Bomat Couriers. Those are running around in some decks. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Part of Kieran's kind of frustrating, but yeah, it has mm -hmm. some uses. And uh, looking at win rates from at MTG underscore data on Twitter... Uh, Paradox Engine Combo actually had a really good weekend across all the SCG events and a Japanese uh, historic championship. 54% um, win rate, which is pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, yeah. looking across the board here, that for a, a deck that's really only picked up in popularity recently, seeing a lot of early success. And looking at its matchup spread, it's beating the best decks in the format. It's you know it's beating four color mid range. It's beating salt type mid range. It's bleeding blue white control. Fifty fifty versus goblins, but I mean, not a huge surprise there. It's it's weird to see such a huge difference in percentage uh, with it against Rakdos versus Jund. Thirty three percent against Rakdos and sixty six percent against Jund. That's kind of crazy. Rakdos is just fast enough to punish your setup turns. Like if John ever spends some time like casting a trail of crumbs or like trying to get to Corvold or like they miss on a company or something, like that's like if you're playing Corvold, you're trying to get to five and they're trying to get to five for Paradox Engine, but their engine's going to pop off way faster than your Corvold. So I'm not too surprised there. Mm. Yeah, I, lo yeah. I love that it's the, rocking the. The John decks, the John decks are so much slower than the actual Rakdos decks when you just like. Look at the cards in the deck and see how, like, their whole game plans are entirely different, even though they're like more than half of their deck is the same cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love that Paradox Engine combo rocks 100% win rate versus nine lives, <laughs> which, like, <laughs> makes total sense because those cards, like, it just doesn't care about nine lives or solemnity. Yeah. So that's funny. Wait, how does it nine lives stop damage? Uh, does it? Let me look. Let me look it up. But like the the engine combo deck doesn't have to win with reservoir, right? I suppose, yeah. It could just go get something else. What's its what's its backup win con if it's not blasting people? Let me look. Well it has um it has the uh meteor golem and then like any of the older versions with Jace just kind of laugh at them. 
Yeah, the Jace versions, that makes sense. You just mill yourself and nine yeah. legs can't do anything about it. If you have meter or golem, you can you can probably loop those. Right. Yeah, you can loop the meteor golems and uh, blow up uh, solemnities or something. Blow up solemnity and then just blast them until their nine lives are full of counters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> blast them nine times. <laughs> Doing it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> There's a way. Yeah. There's a way to do it. That's cool. But yeah, I mean, historic. I'm starting to see a lot more people tweeting about how Earl has to go. Uh, it's one of the popular topics right now on Twitter in uh, in regards to historic. I don't know how I I, mean, I assume Phil hasn't played really any historic uh, cam. I, I think you have, but I don't know how you guys feel about this topic, but I think I, I think it's only a matter of time to be honest. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's like it's probably a problem, either it or Nissa or something. I don't know what it is, but the format feels solved and stagnant which is kind of a bad combo. Like, solved ha ends up happening to formats. I think standard is solved at the moment, but it's about to get shaken up. But I think historic is solved in such a way that it's not going to get shaken up, which is what I meant by stagnant. Like, it's hard to imagine cards being introduced that can compete with the raw power level of this blue-green base that the salt high decks operate on. Yeah. So, I mean, we we saw this happen in standard, and obviously that's a much smaller card pool, but when it's happening in a format like historic... I mean, I mean, and think about it. Earl is dominating modern as well, and mm -hmm. it's dominating pioneer. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Just, the, the big problem with Earl is that it just makes every game look the same. It's just like it's all about turning your resources into fuel to make more Euros, and then once the last Euro sticks, you just die. Yeah, and maybe just, that's why you just I, get I, drowned in in like value and a card advantage. Yeah, maybe that's kind of my complaint, is that, like, the games with Nyssa, like, Nyssa has one mode, and Uro has one mode, and the deck is consistent enough that it does that every time. So, like, there's never any clever use of your Nyssa. You just make a bunch of mana and attack. You just escape Uro and attack. Like, there's no thought to how powerful these cards are, so the games become very repetitive, which kind of made me lose my interest in the format. Yeah, I'm kind of starting to feel the same way, to be honest. Like I may not have played much in the way of historic, but I, I've watched a decent amount of like like the Star City events. And just like, and I just watch it. And I'm just like, I've already seen these games played out. I watched it in standard for months. They're the same games. Yeah, the, the, maybe the some card, people like that though. The cards are a little different, but like the games are the same. And yeah, it's not necessarily the fact that the games are the same. It's like the games are the same, and the cards are still just like. I'm not going to say unbeatable because they're obviously beatable, but it's like it just feels like so suffocating when you lose to these cards. Yeah, but you know, you know those people who you know on Tinder or Bumble or wherever they're like, you know, my favorite show is The Office. I love it. I am so shy it's leaving Netflix. I could quote every episode. I just put it on the background. I love rewatching it. Maybe people yes, feel the same about watch. this. <laughs> Maybe people are like, you know, I just love Uro Nissa reruns. I can quote every turn. I like watching them again. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a sneaking suspicion that that isn't the case. Can I <laughs> can I report all of those accounts? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, historic, kind of tough to imagine it changing that much. There's so many cool things in the format that it would be kind of nice to see it shaken up. But for now, it's sort of where it's been for about a month. Yeah, I'm like, that, like that's kind of the issue I was like talking with you guys before. Like I think it was in one of the DWC chats, stream chats, where it's just like. I feel like a lot of people are still in the honeymoon phase on historic where it's like, you can do this cool thing and you can do that cool thing. And then you play in a tournament and you get Nissa Uro and you're just like, but I'm doing this cool thing. And then you just get your, get the soul beaten out of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of the trap of historic, right? Like you, you get such a different experience playing on ladder than you do when you play in an actual event. Like ladder, it feels like you can still kind of do whatever and get get away with it and have a pretty solid win rate. But the moment you step foot into any actual tournament, it's like the reality just punches you in the gut. You're like, oh, right, it's all it's all just Nissa Uro. <laughs> it always yep, has. Like, look at look at how people like blew up and lost their minds when who was it Kowalski was on the the. Uh, championship feature match with the nine lives and mm -hmm. just like locking out reduke and yeah. even in the discord everyone there was just losing their minds like 
this guy's playing unplayable draft commons and he's just destroying him. It's like, mm-hmm. that's, that's like the peak thing where it's like, same with modern where it's just like, you get this like weird thing and you're like, this format's amazing because you can do this weird thing. And it's like less than 1% of the things that anyone will ever do in the format. Yeah. And people are just like holding out hope for that one little, like that one little hit of serotonin. That, yeah. Like, I guess gets yeah. the right way. As you brought up modern, if you compare like old modern FNMs, people were doing wild stuff. They brought their pet decks. They brought whatever. Like you'd see red, white, Norn the wary source, soul sisters, like insane stuff. But of course the GPs and the pro tours, they don't look like that. It's just whatever twin pod, whatever death shadow deck is about to get something banned from it. Yeah. They're entirely different formats. Like I've, I've said that for as long as I can remember now, it's like store level modern and competitive modern are just not the same format. And I think you, you see that with like historic in on the ladder and in the leagues or whatever, and then historic in your like competitive events. That makes sense. Let's put a pin in historic for now. Yeah. If people are having fun, people are having fun. That's great. Yeah. As long as they're playing Magic. Yeah. I still I still got to put some time aside to push into Mythic again so I don't I don't get bumped down cuz like once you get, once you get there one month, you only get reset to platinum. So it's such a shorter way to play up. So if I if I don't play up to it, I'm going to have to go from like gold next time I want to and that sucks. It's <laughs> so much longer. Yeah. So I got to figure out what format I actually want to do it in because I've been splitting it. I did it in standard and then I did it in historic and then I did it in historic again. So maybe I'll go back to standard. I don't know. Just play Gruel. Yeah, I'll probably just do that. Give it's me some so good. Four, four Ember Cleaves. Four. You just put four Ember Cleave in your deck and you're good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably do that. It's been a while since I played some standard. We'll get back into it. But uh, Ember Cleave is so fun. <laughs> It is fun. I'll give you that. There is nothing I enjoy more than watching my opponents try and line up blocks just and then just realize <laughs> that they cannot beat an Ember Cleave. And then they just click buttons at random. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you can't beat it, you just got to block like it's not there and die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah. Like, the best part of Arena is just, like you watch them moving around the creatures and you can actually just like see the moment where they get the realization because they're like constantly moving and then they stop for like five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're just like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> what yeah. if he has it? <laughs> Speaking of your love for Embercleave, uh, anyone who's chatted with P. Sams over the years in person or in our Discord or who knows Phil sort of in any capacity knows that he's a big fan of aggro decks. Loves playing the quick strategies, loves smacking people, has forever. Known as the Red Mage, the Aggro God, Smart King, whatever other title. The true Emperor Cleave cultist. Yes. That's me. That's me. The first and primary. And so... Cult makes it sound so dirty, though. (laughs) (laughs) Since he's here on the show, uh, and I am not good at aggro at all, we wanted to tap into his wealth of knowledge a bit, discuss aggro as it's been in standard, as it is now, and uh, just chat about it a bit. And so I guess to start on like a general note, I don't get the appeal of playing aggro decks because to me it feels so fragile. It feels like the entire game I might lose at any point. Like if I get Wrath, I'll lose. If my opponent stabilizes, I'll lose. And there's nothing to play towards. So I don't know, that like fragility of it puts me off. But you said that's what you like about aggro decks. Do you just not want to feel something in your life sometimes? <laughs> I want to feel very secure and a handful of cards and an inability to lose the game I'm playing. And yeah, I but, work towards so, that. Yeah, but sometimes you only need to have that one card in your hand and it's Embercleave. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Just play into hope I draw an Embercleave in time and to hope that my opponents like can't stabilize shakes me. I love it. Like I said, like what you call fragility is like that's the thing I love about aggro decks because i always like i always want to spend like as much effort as i can to make sure i don't mess anything up so the house of cards never crumbles like that's that's the enjoyment and magic for me Mm -hmm. i can see that yeah the fragility doesn't exist if you don't let it exist like it's a very kind of like simplistic way of looking at it but like 
like the house of cards doesn't necessarily crumble unless you let it. And I mean, sometimes you're just going to draw like garbage, but that applies to everyone. So Wait, so are you saying that if you actually use your brain when playing an aggro deck, you'll you'll get different results? I'm not going to say that certain members of the Discord have referred to the deck as drool aggro. <laughs> However, it turns out that when you're playing a game and then you think about what you're doing, you have a better chance of succeeding. But Phil, this, that's, this that, advice. that's not why Here's I play thing. aggro. I don't want to think about what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I know we didn't bring this up or anything, but I know we all watched this game. The game from the Zendikar Rising Championship, Ottenberg Chet and Jan Moritz Merkel, the, the Gruel Adventures Mirror last round of day one. And you guys were streaming it. Mm-hmm. And I was in the chat. And I even remember Steli saying like, wow, Autumn's got a perfect hand. And her hand was great. And I was like, this hand's a little awkward. And then you just watched Autumn play this perfect game where they just didn't play Brush Fire Elemental into a very obvious uh, bone, so, bo- bone Crusher Giant on turn two. And just most people are going to be like, two mana, got to tap my mana. Yep. And it's like, because they don't have like, it. Merkel didn't play a thing on turn one and didn't play a thing on turn two, kept seven. So it's like the only card they can ha- Merkel can have is Bone Crusher Giant. There's no way they're keeping seven and not and not having something outside of that play sequence. Yeah. So like, and Autumn's hand was uh, Brush Fire Elemental, Brush Fire Elemental, Fabled Passage, Fabled Pass. So it's just like turn three, turn two pass, turn three, Brush Fire, Fabled Passage. Turn four, brush fire, play the other fable passage. They didn't break it the turn before, so then they just had like five fives, and, and the bone crusher could never like line up, and the removal spells just couldn't line up, and they just they just like took took the playback by passing on turn two, and it was just like you're not going to see a lot of people make these plays, but it just played incredibly. Yeah, I do, and like that's the th- that's the thing I really appreciate because like. All these like really good plays go into like four turns, three turns. All your most important plays are very compressed along a very small period of time. Mm-hmm. Where whereas like when you're playing like other decks, it's like you just have to play like every turn for like the whole game. Basically, either you're playing it well or you're just like hanging on for dear life. Yeah. I mean, I think because of this, aggro decks are like actually the hardest to play. At least yeah, in my opinion, because there's so many decisions all at once that you have to get right. And to me, the game plan isn't as obvious. There's like kind of a bunch of small, minor, different ways you can play the turns. Whereas, say, okay, so for contrast, a control deck, the game plan is obvious, always. Everyone knows what to do with a control deck for the first five turns. You just play lands and don't die. <laughs> now, how you don't die is sometimes subtle. You have to know what threats your opponent has. But it doesn't change that that's your plan you're not worried about anything else other than stopping your opponent and stabilizing. And then once you do that, you also don't really have to think because you just kind of wait until you have a win con and then you go from there because you're stabilized. Combo decks, things like Storm or things like Paradox Engine, you know what you're setting up towards constantly and you know, at least in something like Storm, that you wait until the last possible moment, which is pretty easy to judge, and then you try and go off. So those plans are always like pretty obvious, I think, in contrast to the correct lines to play in aggro decks. I think basically arguing which kind of deck is hardest is essentially a semantics argument. Yeah. You have to realize that like with the aggressive decks, like your most important and your most complex decisions all happen at like turn one, two, three, like the very extreme early. It's like basically finding out which set of turns has your most complex and most important decision. So like, and that's why like things like, land sequence and spell sequence is so important to an aggressive deck because if you just play your cards in a way where you don't maximize your early game, then the slower decks kind of catch up with you and take over. Because, like, I mean, just, like, very obviously the slower, more controlling decks, their cards just, on average, are going to cost more, so they're going to be a bit more powerful, and then you just pull away. And the whole point of the aggressive deck is just to not let the game get to that point. 
Mm-hmm. Or like if you do get to that point where it's like like the mid game, you just like draw like a burn spell or an ember cleave and like punk them out, and then you're like, oh, the aggro deck stole the game from me. Well, yeah, sort of, but they also played in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, setting yourself up for your outs, which I guess yeah, every deck does. Yeah, it makes it's sense. Just, it's just like how how you get, how you try and get the game to the end point you want. So yeah, it's just the development terms of an aggro deck are like one, two, and three, where most other decks can just like take off turn one. Yeah, maybe maybe that's just what I'm doing wrong when I try and pick up aggro decks or try and like play them seriously. Is because I'm so used to kind of not think or not not thinking in the first terms of aggro or in I mean control. But like the first turns of control, the way I, I play it anyway, is like you just make your land drops and then you kind of decide what each piece of your hand is going to do based on how your opponent plays. Like it, because it's so reactive, you start crafting a plan as your opponent enacts their plan. And so when I go play aggro decks, I don't like tank looking at my opening hand, planning out how my first three turns are going to be important. I kind of just go with that same approach of like, this hand seems like it can start playing. And then I try and make a plan like halfway into that based on how the game's gone. And it sounds like from what you're saying, that's going to set me up incorrectly a lot of the time. Well, like if you're, if you're just going into it and you're just like not using your cards necessarily like efficiently, like like they just let you make game actions on turn one, you're allowed. <laughs> you you don't just have to play a tap land on turn one. Yeah, that's well, kind I mean, of a that's kind of a big issue right now, and specifically standard though is that there aren't really any good one drops. I have definitely not complained over the past two years about red one drops. It's definitely not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like I, there there actually aren't really any good ones. Like the the. Aggro deck of the format is Gruel Aggro, right? And Gruel Aggro is not your traditional low to the ground, you know, super all in early game aggressive deck. It, it's it's more of a mid range deck that just has certain draws that kill you on turn four. But it, it's definitely well, it's definitely like an aggressive slanting mid range deck. But like when you when you get into it, like mid range decks can be almost anything, just because like. The range on a mid range deck is just basically a Magic the Gathering deck. No, it's only the mid. <laughs> oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah mid range can kind of. But of like tra- traditionally, when you think of a mid range deck, you're not thinking about you. You're not dying on turn four, right? Where there are plenty of draws out of Gruel Aggro, all that involve Ember Cleave generally that that end the game that early. Well, yeah, but I, I would also say that like. Like when you see a, a air quotes aggressive deck like rule, that's when that's when you're seeing like the good aggressive deck because it doesn't just try and kill you turn four. Mm-hmm. It can play a bit of a later game, but it also has these aggressive starts where it, like you keep a six card hand and it's like a two lander on you miss on turn three, like you're dead. But also, if you're actually interacting and we're playing a back and forth game, like I can also play that game. Mm-hmm. I think well, this was the distinction you pointed out to us in the pre-show about when you like an aggro deck versus when you don't is that you like the decks that have that ability to pivot into a bit of a grindier game if need be yeah like i like i like the decks that can punish the bad draws but i don't like the decks that essentially only are looking to punish bad draws i guess yeah so some of the examples of this like you pointed out uh historical examples of grindy aggro cards things like light up the stage Gives a lot of reach. Well, not, gives a lot of longevity and card advantage to aggressive decks. Experimental Frenzy was kind of the king of this for a while. You could completely wrath and stabilize against a red deck, and then if they popped off with Frenzy, you would still die. Um, Chandra Torch of Defiance, recent inclusion into Historic, is giving Goblins decks and other mono red decks a lot of staying power because it's card advantage, and well, that card just does it does a ton. It's a threat that's also card advantage. Yeah, Chandra Torch is definitely the. Uh the big example of the like kind of the aggressively slanted mid-range planeswalker that is just always going to show up in aggro deck sideboards. Mm-hmm. Like the very much the Chandra Torch of Defiance, Gideon Ally of Zendikar style 
I need a big card for my aggressive deck. Oh, look, this card is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And to contrast this, like the decks that are sort of the decks that maybe are the the caricatures of aggro decks or the stereotypical aggro decks, maybe what people think of when they think of losing to aggro decks are these like the very one trick pony um, all in decks. So yeah. Cavalcade if, of Calamity yeah. was around for a while in standard. That deck didn't really do anything. It just tried to play one drops in a Cavalcade. Didn't really have a backup plan. It just hoped that was good enough. Yeah, like if if a mono red deck has pump spells, I probably don't like it. Rimrock Knight excluded. Rimrock Knight is my homie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like if basically if the deck can't pivot into being like a serviceable mid range deck, I'm not interested. So if your deck is like and like obviously you can't have this kind of deck right now because as previously mentioned, they don't really make one drops. But if your deck is only like ones and twos, you can't transition. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not even sure an aggro deck in that vein could exist right now, even if there were good one drops, just because of cards like Bone Crusher Giant and Love Struck Beast and with how popular those cards are in the format. Like both those cards put such a huge limit on what aggro decks can do in the early turns of the game. They do, but like like if you had a bunch of like good one drops and two drops, you can make it work. But like, like I said, like those, like they are definitely the kinds of decks where, like, if the if the interaction starts, it, that's basically the end of them. They're basically hoping to goldfish. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I mean, like, I want to play a mono red deck that actually is like interacting my, with my opponent. I I don't want to play a deck that basically acts like my opponent isn't there, and I'm just like counting to twenty. I like how you summed it up in the pre-show. You said that. I mean, some aggro decks are built to do 20 damage. And if you ask them to do much more than that, they can't. Whereas the good aggro decks, in your opinion, can slow down a bit and if need be, can produce 25, 30 damage. It's also the kind of thing where it's like, if your mid-range deck is more creature-based, see like the Gruel Adventures decks right now, where you're just making like good creatures on rate and not just like 1-1s one and 2-2s two and some burn spell. You mm -hmm. can... You can much more play the uh, the aggressive game, but also the like get the battlefield to size up in your favor, almost regardless of what your opponent has. A lot of that is a function of a card like Emberclave too, where it's just like it almost doesn't matter what the size of your opponent's creatures are because your creatures are big enough that the first strike with Emberclave is going to take care of. But that's mm -hmm. that's why in the previous Mono Red deck, Emberclave wasn't as good because it was basically only good on a card like Enax. Or like Steam Camp. Yeah, that's an interesting point. When you're more based on like the actual like rate stats of the creatures in your deck, uh, so like having like three mana three threes, four mana four fours, as opposed to that like one mana one ones, and then like two mana one ones or two twos. Like once you stop going up to three mana three three, um, your deck becomes less able to uh, punch up essentially. Yeah, that makes sense. A card like Bone Crusher Giant top decked on turn eight or nine in a game that's kind of slowed down is still going to be sizable. It'll still probably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with whatever's on the board. It'll have its uses. But those other yeah. red decks, like if you're drawing a 2-2 two -two or a 1-1 one -one all that late, it's not going to do anything. That's why Bone Crusher Giant is so good. It's because at every part of the game, that's the card you want to draw. <laughs> like, yeah. you're, nev you're never going to be like, man, I drew Bo Bone Crusher Giant. That sucks. Because like at its worst, it's three mana four three, mm -hmm. and that's that's just an above rate creature. Yeah, that makes sense. So we talked a bit. This is what makes aggro decks good. This like ability to pivot and play a bit grind grindier game to you know produce more damage if needed. I think it's interesting uh, if we look at like the history of standard over the past year. There was a period where aggro like just didn't really exist, and it's cool to look at why that happened. And it, I mean, some of you listening might suspect that it's the uh, usual I, offenders. I could tell you. I didn't I think it was why. very cool. It's uh, it's, one, it's green and it's blue, and and that's it. <laughs> but also, uh, also, there was also another card that also gained life. 
but it only cost one mana and it was black. And this card was a 1-1. One, one. And I also didn't think that was very cool. <laughs> Both of those cards were uh, pretty restrictive on uh, aggro decks in standard, I would say. What's what's this black one? One you're talking about? I'm Cauldron, Cauldron, familiar. Cauldron familiar. Oh, Cauldron familiar. Yeah, all right. right. I was trying to think of something with lifelink, and I like wouldn't couldn't remember. But it, yeah, it does gain life. Yeah, banned in standard currently. Still true. Praise Jesus. But yeah, the cards we're talking about: Nissa, Uro are the big ones. Crisis also there, hanging out with the squad. Kind of just removed aggro from the format. There was a while where PSMs you like weren't even really playing. Because the types of decks you liked just didn't really have a shot. That specifically, like the ramp decks, were like the kind of magic I just like had no desire to play. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll run over through this quickly because we've talked about these cards a lot. But in the far, far past, back you know, in a galaxy far, far away, ramp decks used to have to play ramp spells that only ramped. And Wait. then they had to hope that they didn't die in the meantime. And then they got to play something big. Wait, what? And, <laughs> and aggro decks could kill them while they were doing that. You know, you cast, you tap four mana for explosive vegetation. I mean, you're tapped out, you might die. Also, sometimes they either had the ramp cards or the threats, or they just had the threats and not the ramp cards. Yeah, their deck might not function. That, that also yeah. used to happen. That's why ramp was so unplayable for so long. Like... Your good, your good draws made your deck look incredible, but then you realized that you just weren't getting the good draws all that often. Mm -hmm. Compare that to these, I mean, the cards everyone knows about now. Nissa is a ramp spell that is also a haste threat, that is also a vigilance haste threat, so it also plays defense. Crisis refuels and gains life, and Uro does all three. It gains life, it plays aggro, it plays D, and it ramps. Okay, it does all four. It does it all. And that, yeah, the the concentration of power in these cards, the fact that ramp decks and the mid-range decks didn't have to choose which part of the game they wanted to play. They could just play all of it at once for three mana or four or five mana. Meant that aggro had no window. But something interesting here, to compare these types of cards, Nissa Earl Crisis, to cards that people might think hate out aggro. I mean, I've seen some sideboards with like life goes on in it or... Occasionally, you see people bring in like life, like dedicated life gain cards. Newer players sometimes do this against aggro. That's not actually what you want to be doing. Like, just gaining life isn't usually good enough to beat these aggro decks. That's not but, usually how it works. Like, there are specific instances where, like, if you need specifically like one turn, then those cards can be fine. Mm -hmm. But just gaining life isn't necessarily getting you ahead of even like a decent aggressive deck. Yeah. And uh, yeah, as we were saying, like the decent aggressive decks are built to be able to do, to play a game that can, you know, do in some more than 20 damage. Like they can play through some life gain. They're expecting that. What you should actually be doing when you're sideboarding or just trying to strategize against aggressive decks is you have to clock them back. Like you need to kind of get something that's a step bigger and a step stronger than what they have and then kill them with it before they can draw into burn or draw into something that kills you. And Nissa does that perfectly. Uro does that perfectly. Yeah, and that's actually if, why it's so hard. Like, like if you give the aggressive deck time, they're going to be able to undo you casting a life gain spell. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the problem with Nissa specifically. It's like, every turn it's a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, not only does... And, then the, the, and those are blocking, so you can't race. Yeah, not only did the 3-3 three, three stop the aggressive deck from pushing their damage, they also kill the aggressive deck. And aggressive decks and, usually don't have very good defensive options. And then like in the in like the Nissa uh, situation specifically, the red deck in that format was just like it didn't have good rate creatures. So like a 3-3 was just busted. It was like the best thing they could be doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if your deck was full of like Kazandu Mammoths and Questing Beasts like the Girl decks are now, Nissa's still gonna be a great card, but like now you're not just like smashing your Scorch Spitter into a 3-3. You're not smashing your Fervent Champion into a 3-3. Yeah, not, not quite as bleak now as it would have yeah. been then. Like, I'm not going to say that the Gruul decks would be good against Nissa who shakes the world. Because that card's wild. <laughs> but, not, there is not much that was good against that card, let's yeah, be honest. You're more likely to actually be able to steal a game against a card like Nissa when your creatures are just good on raid as opposed to 
good on speed. Mm -hmm. But But I think this is a nightmare for aggressive decks. And this is, I mean, this is a nightmare period. Like that's a lot of the reason why I didn't enjoy playing these decks is it was like, it was literally just a Nissa race essentially. Mm -hmm. And there are ways you can play around it, of course. Like, but like if you drew Nissa and your opponent didn't like, uh, yikes. Yeah. That's, that's rough. But I think like that, that point that like Nissa is good because she could attack the aggro decks. It's like a point that people can learn from for playing against aggro decks in general in any format, like all times. The types of sideboard cards you see out of something like, say, blue-white control, just a generic blue-white control deck in some format that needs to play against aggro. You see things like timely reinforcements, which are creatures and life gain. Or you'll see things like Baneslayer Angel or Lyra Dawnbringer when she was around. Because while these cards have life gain, it's sort of incidental to the fact that if they can just clock back the red decks. And this is actually a mistake I see people make sometimes. They'll board an Elyra. They'll resolve Elyra against aggro. And then they just won't attack with it, thinking that like it's this defensive life gain creature. And they'll just sit back, being like, oh, you know, the red deck's not attacking me. That's good. They can't attack past this Lyra until the red deck draws like a Fry or what was that card they used to play? Fight with Fire? Yeah. It's like sometimes even if you don't kill the the uh, the Bane Slayer, the the Lyra, or whichever one, mm-hmm. if you have a couple creatures, then you're just like, okay, attack with my creatures. There's like, well, block, and then you're like, okay, kill my kill my own creature. Or like, if you're just sitting back on the Angel, sometimes you can just build a board that goes wider. Yeah, and like the aggro decks know these cards are in the format; they're going to be expecting them. They're going to have some plan, and so if you just sit there, like they'll find like it's not. It's not this unbeatable defensive tool. Why those cards are so good is because you can just start killing your opponent. Like You only have to attack four times for a Lyra to kill them. And in the meantime, they have to do damage to make up the lifelink. Like, the lifelink buys you time to kill them with your threat is why it's good. So it can seem kind of counterintuitive, but you just got to start attacking them. And like in this, in this like example specifically, it's like, it's not like this is a new thing. Like this is like 10 years of white control decks boarding in Baneslayer Angel against aggressive decks. It's not like this is a new plan. You're not going to, like, juke someone. Be like, oh, I got you with my Baneslayer Angel. I bet you haven't seen this before. (laughs) We know it's coming. (laughs) And, like, that's, like, you mentioned timely reinforcement. Like, that card's a disaster. You gain six life and I can't go around it. Mm -hmm. I forgot how messed up that card was until someone cast it against me a few weeks ago in Historic, and I was like, hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah, that card, that card is just like, the train is all the way off the tracks. Like, yeah. like that I, card is so hard to beat. That card, I think that card was in Standard when I first started playing Magic back in original Innistrad. I think it was in Standard. I believe that's true. Yeah. So it had been a while since I had come face-to-face with a Timely Reinforcements, and man... <laughs> It uh, it doesn't feel good. It, it's like those all those memes. It's like moments before disaster. <laughs> Timely reinforcements on the stack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what the things I've done to myself to try and like play around. Timely reinforcements is things I'm not proud of. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely gut shot myself a few times. Easy. Nice. Yeah. Not proud, like I said. Just thinking outside the box. You gotta try and win somehow, man. <laughs> you can't just get, you can't just give up until you can. I mean, honestly, like if people wanna like message me about like aggro in the Discord or whatever, like I'm not always like on, but like if you wanna message me about things, I'll eventually get back to you. I definitely don't mind. I love talking about aggressive decks. Like if you ever got any questions. All shoot right. me a message, whatever. Yeah, P Sam's you can it's all good. You, you can plug plug your Twitter. Anyone who's in the Discord will know P Sam's as he's uh always there in on conversations. But if people yeah. wanted to find you, where could they find you? Just at P Sam's, like very basic. So wow. yeah. Like I said, message me. I'll I'll get back to you eventually. I love talking about aggressive decks. I don't necessarily play as much as I used to but i i just love talking about aggressive decks i just find the games like 
so much more interesting because like I said, so many decisions in such a like confined area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what, that's, what's interesting to me. Speaking of a bunch of decisions in a confined area and some sort of tight play. Ooh, this is my favorite. I guess we call this the blowout of the week. I don't know if it's so much a standard blowout in that it was someone losing to something unexpected that they shouldn't have played around. It's kind of technically a mistake for my opponent, but I think it was an interesting mistake and of like me playing to my outs and my opponent getting greedy. So it was a draft game in Zendikar Rising. And the important parts of this is that I had a few creatures, none of which flew. But one of them was a Cleric of Chill Depths, so a 1-3. My opponent had a lot of creatures, one of which was a Legion Angel with a Skyclave Pickaxe on it. So that's the equipment that has Landfall plus 2 plus 2 for its turn. And they also have Morassa Root Grazer, which can put a basic land into play at instant speed, which I know they have because they picked it up on end step. The other important thing is I have Synchronized Spellcraft in my hand. So I can't Synchronize Spellcraft the Legion Angel. What because then they will resp- Spellcraft do? Just like five mana, four damage to something, and then it hits them for some extra base on your party. Okay. Just a removal spell. Okay. But importantly, it's four damage. So I can't shoot the Legion Angel because they'll respond by instant speed putting in the land with their Root Grazer, and it'll become a... 6-5 with 4 damage on it. I'm also at 7, and they had just attacked me with everything. And regardless of how I blocked, because I didn't have a flyer, if they just did nothing, I can't kill the Legion Angel because they can respond. And there was 7 damage getting through. So if they just pass the turn, I lose. Or just pass priority, I lose. But I put my 1-3 in front of their Scythe Cat, which at the moment was a 2-1, thinking that maybe they'll get greedy and put the land into play to try and make this a 3-2. And then I can respond and kill the angel and not die. And that's what happened. I tricked them. Jemaine. I blocked their 2-1. And if they had just done nothing, I would have died. But so instead, act- they put the land in to try and save their 3-2, which let me, in response, kill their flyer, which meant I didn't take lethal, and then I just killed them on the crackback because they had no blockers. Jeez, so instead of just passing the damage and letting you die, they just tried to go for the extra and save their irrelevant creature, and then they lost. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of fi- feel like things like this happen a lot in like lower lower level limited where it's just like people feel like they're like they have to make plays mm-hmm. it's like I can make this play so I have to make it and I I think one of the like the first steps in like leveling up is realizing you don't have to make plays and you don't like you don't have to spend all your mana every turn yeah I mean I knew I was dead and I knew my only out was that they would get greedy. So I blocked in order to try and trick them into doing it, and it worked. They did it, so... Yeah, that's there's a, my big brain play. There's a lot of um, a lot of games like that where like your only play is like you have to do things to make your opponent feel like they need to do something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I felt pretty smart about it. I got the classic, like, rope <laughs> after, <laughs> after I killed their angel. Nice. Did you hit him with the oops? No, I just hit him with my creatures. <laughs> I'll take that too. <laughs> All right. On that That's note, my favorite way to hit people. <laughs> on that note, thank you all for joining the club this week. Make sure, as always, check out wizardtower.com for all your magic single needs and dwc.gg for all your DWC needs. If you want to support the show, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash this org- uh, DWC podcast. And however you listen to the show, whether it's Podbean, iTunes, any podcast app, leave a review, rate the podcast, share it with your friends. Everything helps, keeps this thing growing, bring it to new listeners. Thank you again to P. Sams for joining us on this episode, filling in for Adam. Appreciate Thanks you. Thanks for Adam. having me. Maybe next time I won't have to bother you guys for two years to have me back. We'll see. <laughs> no guarantees. Yeah. Well, if, uh, you ever, if, you ever, if you ever need an awkward third wheel, you know where to find me. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> and that being said, we'll catch you guys next week. See ya. Have a great one.